Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes. We'll live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now it is well I'm walking in freedom for God so loved God so loved the world Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you today to Olive Branch Baptist Church in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is here with us. We have just sung it and it is true and I am glad that you are here. That's why we meet together is to be with each other and to meet God. So as I often pray, as I often tell you, because God's here and we are here, uh, take the advantage of it in this sense. I mean, we're not just here to waste time this morning. We are here to meet the God of the universe, for, to hear Him, to worship Him, and for Him to meet us and to change us. So keep that in mind as we worship together. I'm so glad that you're here today, and I wanted to read one of my uh, favorite psalms this morning as well. It's sort of as a call to worship in, in addition to the song we just sang. It's Psalm 100, a very familiar psalm, and it says so much about our worship of the Lord. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. 
Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Father, we are thankful that you are our God, that you are our shepherd, and that we are your sheep. We are thankful, Lord, that we have come here today to give you thanks for the great God that you are and the wonderful things that you have done. Father, I also pray this morning as we begin uh, to worship you, that I know, Lord, there are many in our congregation who need you right now, God. They, they are going through grief or they're going through uncertain times. Uh, they uh, need your healing. And I pray, God, that you would uh, meet them and that you would hear their cry for help and that you would answer their prayer. Lord, I know that there are people uh, who still uh, aren't ready or cannot come and worship together with us here in person and in public. And so I pray for them, Lord, that you would continue to minister to them and encourage them uh, when they can't have encouragement uh, from fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you, Lord, again for our time to worship you. And I pray that you are pleased with what you uh, hear from our lips and pleased with what is in our hearts and pleased with how we listen and obey. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord together. So today for the children's sermon, I don't have any props and I don't have any fun game, but don't let that uh, make you tune out just yet because we are going to cover like 10 chapters of the Bible in like three and a half minutes. So, <laughs> but since I'm also a Baptist preacher, if it gets to four minutes, it makes sense. So uh, when Jesus, right before Jesus was going to go back up into heaven, he told his disciples that they were going to go and had, that they would have a mission. And uh, this is called the Great Commission. And so it's in the end of Matthew. And basically what Jesus tells us, guys, is that uh, the disciples, his followers, were going to be his witnesses all over the world, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And uh, that sounds really good, right? Like, 
hey, this is a movement, this is a message that everybody is going to hear. And so the, uh, you know, eventually the Holy Spirit comes, it empowers the disciples and the apostles to uh, go out and give the message to everybody. But there's a problem with that. And who wants to guess, if you, I guess if you're under the age of 10, who wants to guess what that problem is? But I think there's only three of you under the age of 10. So let's uh, expand that a little. Let's see, I could put Landon on the spot. He doesn't want to be on the spot. All right, so there's this problem that the apostles have. The problem is, is that they have, for, for years, they stay in one spot. So they stay in Jerusalem, even though Jesus had said, look, you're going to go out, you're going to make my name known to the entire world. But the problem is, like I said, they're just kind of stuck. They're staying in one spot, they're comfortable, they're feeling good. But then there's this one moment that happens with this one guy, and his name is Stephen. And so Stephen, he, was, uh, he wasn't one of the original apostles, but he comes along later in the book of Acts, and basically he's, let's, to put it nicely, he's a very smart guy, he knows his Bible pretty well, but this makes a lot of people upset. And so eventually Stephen gets brought before all these people, all these leaders, these judges, and basically they say, hey, you're not a good person. And Stephen says, well, let me go ahead. Let me explain to you all of this stuff and how it all points to Jesus. So Jesus, or I'm sorry, Stephen gives them a gospel presentation. And what happens, or how about this? What do you think happens to Stephen? You think everybody hears this message and they're really happy about it? And they're like, wow, Stephen's really smart. He has some good ideas. Or do you think they were even angrier than what they were before? Adults, you can answer this too, because I think you probably know the answer. Yes. They were angry. So who wants to guess what happened to Stephen? He got stoned, which means they killed poor Stephen. And if I ended the kid's sermon there, it would be very sad. But that's not where the story ends, because guess what happened because of that moment? Where do you think all the disciples went? They finally went everywhere. So what this tells us is is that sometimes we think that, you know, bad when bad things happen, that's the end of the story, right? Like, we're stuck here. God must not have any plans in this bad stuff. But really, what we can see all throughout the Bible and through the life and death of Stephen is that God does work all things for his goodness and for his glory. Because if that moment did not happen to Stephen, do you guys think that uh, the gospel message would have left Jerusalem? Do you think it would have got to all the people that it got to? I'm getting, there's a chorus of no's out there. And you'd be right. Um, And so here's what this means for us. If that did not happen to Stephen, we would not be here today. We would not be here in church. We wouldn't hear uh, awesome music. We wouldn't hear kids' sermons because all the gospel would just still be stuck in this one spot. So what this means is that no matter what is going on in your guys' life, God has a plan for it. It might seem bad right now, but ultimately God is going to use it for something amazing. And so I'm going to pray. And then we will get back into worship. Dear Lord, we know that you are in control. We know that you uh, hold this whole world in your hands. We are just so thankful to uh, be able to, to know you and to, to worship you. And we love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
just to find God's peace so serene. And all that he asks is a childlike trust and a heart that is learning to lean. Learning to lean, learning to lean, I'm learning. Claudia and Naomi, thank you so much. I heard, haven't heard that song in a while, and so that was great to hear that, and a beautiful song that fits perfectly with today's sermon, Leaning to Lean on the Lord for Our Strength in Everything that We Need in Life. So thank you so much for singing that this morning. And I think you will all be glad to hear that today is the last sermon in the book of Ephesians. So I don't know how you are. Some people love to be in depth in a book of the Bible and wouldn't mind studying it for not only six weeks or eight weeks, maybe six or eight months. And others kind of get tired of it after a couple of sermons and say, can't we move on to something else? So I don't know which you prefer, but regardless, today is the last sermon in the book of Ephesians. And Paul has been telling us in the second half of Ephesians how to walk to walk worthy of our calling, to walk in new life, to walk in love, to walk in light, to walk in wisdom. As I shared with you at the beginning of this second half of Ephesians, our Christian life is like walking. It's uh, one step after another. It's staying close to God. It's, it's following Him where He leads us. And so it's a beautiful picture of how our relationship with God should be. And the people in the Bible who walked with God give us an example, too, of how to live our life. But today, Paul uses a different metaphor altogether. He doesn't tell us to walk anywhere or with anyone. He tells us to stand. So a different picture, isn't it? We're not moving anywhere. We're just standing. And why would we need to stand and why are we standing and not moving? It's because he tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 12 this. Finally. Now again when you see that word, especially when it's a preacher, don't believe it. Okay, but this is the last thing that he kind of talks about even though it goes on for several verses. Okay, finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen again. Be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Paul now tells us how to fight the spiritual battle that we are in. And this is interesting to me because today we have really two different ways people look at spiritual warfare and the spiritual battle. Some people really just kind of ignore it. You know, there, even some Christian groups will say, well, Satan's really just a, an, an idea. He's not a real person or a real being. And so there's no reason to fight him because he's not even real. Certainly our culture doesn't think of the devil or Satan as a real thing. 
they, you know, they make ridiculous pictures of him and, and think of him as just a, a fantasy or unreal. It's not, nothing to, to worry about. Uh, other Christians take it very seriously. And they almost couch their whole Christian life as this warfare. And you'll hear them talking about binding Satan. And you'll hear them talking about fighting the devil. And you will hear them uh, going uh, to cities, maybe doing prayer walks to try to get rid of the demons that are there and the, and the hold that Satan has on that city. And so it's almost to the point that this is how they see the Christian life. It's a battle. And sometimes it even gets more uh, picturesque and you almost imagine like a, uh, these, well, you've even seen the pictures. You'll see these, these demons with, I mean, they're just grotesque looking. And they're fighting against these Christian soldiers and angels that look just as strong, but look more uh, beautiful, I guess, not grotesque. And, the, and in their mind, is just this battle going back and forth. And you'll even hear them talk about how we're supposed to go and really just kind of attack Satan and fight against him. And I see in the New Testament something that's kind of in between. The reality is Satan is real. He is a real being. He once was an, an angel that has been cast from heaven and has rebelled against God. Paul tells us here we are in a spiritual battle. But I find it interesting that in the New Testament we are never told to go and find Satan. We're never told to go and attack him. We're never told to go and bind him. In fact, I have three words up here that really tell us what we are to do when it comes to our spiritual warfare. That is to resist the devil. We're told if we resist him in the book of James, he will flee from us. We're told to be alert. That's what we're told here in Ephesians, also in 1 Peter. And that verse Peter tells us that our enemy is like a lion that's roaring, looking for who he can devour. So he says, be alert. So again, we're not to ignore the battle. We're not to ignore Satan. We are to be alert. But we are to resist, be alert. And here in Ephesians, we are told to stand. That gives the image of, as Paul says, put on armor and stand. But this isn't advancing. This is defensive. And we're not going backwards. We're standing firm and strong in our faith. So to me, this is the stance. It's a defensive stance. We live our lives alert and resisting Satan's temptations, and we're standing strong in the Lord. And then if Satan comes, we're ready. But we're not looking to pick a fight with him. <laughs> we're not going to win a fight in our own selves if we go and pick one with him. And so what we're told to do is to be ready when he comes and to stand and resist. I also want us to understand this about spiritual battle. We really often don't know when something happens to us where the source comes from. This is a picture of Job. I don't know if you ever saw his photograph or not, but this is him. You know Job's story very well, don't you? And you know that he lost his children, he lost his possessions, he lost his health because he was attacked by Satan himself. The source of all of his trouble came from Satan. But Job never knew that. And this is the key point. It doesn't matter where the source of our trouble comes from. Sometimes it may come from Satan. Sometimes it may come from ourselves. Sometimes it may just come from living in a world that is tainted by sin. In a world where sin is part of it, there is going to be tragedy and disaster and destruction. A place, a planet where Satan is a ruler and has control, he's going to bring destruction and disaster. We who are sinners are going to create our own destruction and disaster. So the source can come from different places, but we don't need to take our time and our energy trying to figure it out where it's coming from because our response is always the same. 
wherever it comes from. And I think that's where Paul in the New Testament wants us to focus on. To focus on our walk with God, our faith with God, to focus on God. And then wherever something comes from, we're ready to face it. And we don't need to try to figure out, is this Satan attacking me or not? So keep that in mind as we come to what Paul tells us to do in this fight. The first thing he tells us is our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, spiritual forces in the heavens. So who is really our enemy? Sometimes we think our enemy are other people. And we see this in our society all the time, where we attack each other. We attack each other's ideas and we attack each other and how we live our lives. And there's this uh, warfare against other people. And it's even worse when it's in the church. And we as Christians attack each other. We're brothers and sisters. The enemy is not your brother or sister. There's no reason to attack. There's no reason to bring down a brother or sister. We're to lift each other up and encourage each other. We Christians have enough people attacking us. We don't need to attack each other. So never see a brother or sister as the enemy. And really don't see fellow human beings as the enemy. Those who are unbelievers, how do you expect them to think and act? They don't know God. How do you expect them to live their lives when Satan does have influence over them? They're not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. That's who we need to direct our anger. And that's where we need to direct our, uh, our defense. Not other people and certainly not other Christians. And our enemy, the devil, is a hideous one. He's intelligent. I mean, he's been around for thousands of years. He's not eternal. He was created by God. He doesn't know everything. He's not God. But he's been around long enough and seen enough people to know how to push our buttons. What he desires more than anything is to destroy. And he does that primarily by deception. We're told he masquerades as an angel of light. You know, he's smart enough to know we're not that stupid. You know, if Satan came with horns and red grotesque face and said, disobey God, and, you know, we're going to say, good, it, Yeah, laugh at him or something. You know, it's not going to be that. It's deception. It's subtle. It's remember the Garden of Eden? Look at the fruit. Look how tasty it looks. God didn't really say that, did he? It was a subtle question to get Eve to doubt God. It was look at what you could have. Not only this delicious fruit, you could be like God. You know, if he'd gone in the garden and and, and came full bore as grotesque and destructive, Eve would have ran the other way. But right there tells us a lot about how he tempts. He got Eve to doubt God. He got Eve to look at something that was pleasing to her eyes. And he got Eve to want something that she desired to be like God. Then she sinned and Adam after her. We're just like Adam and Eve. We're their children. So he uses the, hasn't had really to change his tactics too much. He still does the same thing. Gets us to doubt God 
puts something in front of us that looks pleasing to our eyes and gives us a desire to have something that we want. And then we're tempted. And with our sin nature and that temptation, we often fall as Eve and Adam did, and we sin. He lies, he deceives, he's a murderer. And he doesn't just want your life to be bad. He does want to destroy you. He wants your life to be destroyed, your marriage, your family. He wants this church to be destroyed. All he's looking for is destruction. That's our enemy. The great news is we have a stronger God. And we have a more powerful God. We have a God who's already won the victory. And that's what Paul tells us. He says in the next verses, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Our strength is not very strong. We are weak. And that's why Paul says, Be strengthened. By the Lord's strength. Think again how powerful God is. God created this universe. God raised Jesus from the dead. God is the one who created Satan. God is the one who cast him out of heaven. God is the one who controls him. God is the one who is in control of everything. This is the strength that is available to us because God lives in us. And so Paul says to be strengthened by the strength. We don't focus on our enemy, although we need to know our enemy. But that's not where our focus is. Our time and our energy and our focus isn't thinking about Satan and about his schemes and about his strength and about his deception. We don't think about that. We think about God and his strength and his power and what he can do. And so that's why when we have the strength of God, we can simply stand. We don't need anything else other than the strength of God. Here is the armor of God. There's a picture of it. And I could go into great detail about the different pieces of it. To be honest with you, I get confused when I try to think about all the different pieces of it. (laughs) Okay, I'll be just honest with you. Paul is using the image of a Roman soldier. There's no doubt about that. He's here, in fact, under house arrest. In fact, when he's writing this, there may be a Roman soldier standing right next to him. And so he sees the helmet and the breastplate and the sword and the belt and the shoes. He sees it all right there. Someone that Paul was writing to in Ephesus would have seen Roman soldiers all the time. They were in the Roman Empire. These guys were around all the time. So they were used to seeing it, understood immediately what Paul was talking about. But when I think about it, I get confused. And especially when I try to put, well, how does a helmet of salvation, how does the helmet of salvation work? Why isn't it the belt of salvation? Why isn't it the sword of salvation? Why is it the belt of truth? Why can't it be the shoes of truth? You know, when I try to think about how the pieces and the words that go with them are supposed to work together, I can't put my mind around it. So I'm going to do something different this morning. Instead of focusing on the belt and the sword, and the shield, and the helmet. I'm just going to focus on the words. I think that's more important. The truth, salvation, the word of God. That's how we stand. So I would even encourage you, forget about the helmet, and the sword, and the belt, and all that stuff. Okay, that's just a metaphor. It helped the Ephesians. I think it confuses us. So let me read the verses, and we'll talk about those things. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and have you prepared everything to take your stand. Paul has used the word stand three times. Here it is again. Stand, therefore, with the truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession 
for all the saints. So let's just talk about the words. And the first word is truth. How do we stand against Satan? It starts with the truth. That makes complete sense. His main weapon is deception. How do you defeat deception? You fight it with the truth. And so the truth is how we stand against Satan. This is the truth of the scripture, the word of God. This is the truth really that God is as well. I think all of these words describe God himself and also describe how we have these things as well. So in other words, we have truth that we know, but also God is truth. So think about that as we think about all of these. Again, God is the one who has the strength, who helps us stand. So these characteristics of God and what he possesses helps us fight Satan. But also we have these as well. That's why we put them on. And so it makes complete sense that if we're going to fight deception, we fight with truth. So the more we know about God, the more we know about us, the more we know about reality in this world, the better able we are to stand. Isn't this so true? Don't we see so many people who were part of a church, had some association with a a, a church, we see them follow false religions, we see them abandon God, we see them live a life that's far from what God wants, and it's because they believed a lie and didn't know the truth. So The truth is how we stand. The next word is righteousness. Again, God's righteousness is what covers us. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, instead of our sin, in a sense, God sees the righteousness of Christ. And so righteousness is who God is. And again, when we have this righteousness, I think about it in this way. When we live a life that's right, then Satan has less opportunity to deceive us and to lead us astray. When we live a life that's not filled with righteousness, You know, if we're following down a path that leads us away from God, if we're living a life of sin that we're trying to hide, if we're living a life of sin when we're not thinking about God, isn't it much easier then for Satan to just keep moving us away from God? And isn't it easier for Satan to jump right in there and say, you like sinning this way, here's some other ways you can sin. Why don't you try this? But when righteousness marks our life, It's much harder for him to get in there. It's much harder for him to lead us away from God. So knowing the truth, righteousness is living out that truth, living a life that is right. The next word is the gospel of peace. Knowing the gospel that brings peace, again, helps us stand Against Satan. Now think about it this way. What what is the gospel of peace? The good news. Jesus died for our sins, rose again to life. This gospel is the good news that frees us from Satan. It's the good news that conquers sin. It's the good news that conquers death. So when we have this gospel of peace, this is how we get our freedom. And isn't it true that once we have that freedom, for us to go back to that and to remember it and to rely on it and also to share it with others, this is how we can stand against Satan. I mean, he will lie to us and we can always go back to the truth of the gospel. He can lie to us and say, uh, you're never going to be free of that sin. That's a lie, the gospel of peace tells us the truth. He can lie to us and guilt us into thinking that there's no hope for us. But the truth is, this gospel of peace has freed us and given us eternal life. And it is the image of, this is the shoe. 
And I will use this one thing. The Roman soldier's shoes had like spikes on them to give them traction. And so again, I love the picture, you know, as Satan and his deception maybe is pushing us or trying to move us, this gospel of peace keeps us firm. And then the idea also of taking that with your feet, you do go with your feet and you share that gospel. That image in Isaiah of the one who runs with the gospel and shares it with others. The next word is faith. It's by faith that we believe God and we are saved. It's by faith we live each and every day of our life. Again, Satan is going to lie to us. And sometimes the only way we can live life and answer his lie is to believe God, even when it doesn't seem like it makes sense. That's faith. Even when life doesn't make sense, we have faith that God is in control. Even when it seems like God doesn't care for us, we have faith that he's promised that he does. Even when we can't understand it and figure it out, we have faith that God knows exactly what he's doing. Even when it hurts, we have faith that all things work out for good to those who love the Lord. Faith is vital because faith is what extinguishes those arrows of lies and attack that Satan throws at us. Faith dispels that deception. The next word is salvation. Not only are we saved for eternity, but in the moment of temptation, God can be, bring deliverance and salvation. This is always the promise that God has given us. We're promised, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, that there is No temptation that we face that isn't common to other people and that God is going to prepare a way for us. Those are two very important truths about how Satan attacks and tempts. We often think it's just us. No one else has ever struggled with this. Nope. Everything that happens to us, it's happened before. And people have overcome it before. And God knows who we are. And he's never going to allow Satan to tempt us beyond what we can withstand and bear and overcome. So really, that's a comfort. Because that tells me that we can always have the victory. Always. There's never a time when Satan comes and the attack is too much and we can't have the victory and we fail. That never happens. When we fail, it's because we make a choice and we decide that we are going to sin. And so also it's a comfort, it's a warning. We can never say the devil made me do it because he didn't. You did it. The devil may have suggested something. The devil may have enticed you to do something, deceived you to do something, but you made a choice. So it's a comfort and a warning. The comfort is you'll have the resources. Call out to God. Put on the armor of God. He's there. He's strong. He'll help. You can overcome it. But the warning is don't use the devil as an excuse for your sin. You're the one who has the responsibility. We are promised that salvation, deliverance will come in the time of temptation. The last one, the Word of God. That's the sword. The Word of God is where the truth is. And I love Jesus' example. You know, when Satan tempted him, I imagine Jesus could have done lots of things (laughs) because he's God. When Satan came, Jesus could have just, I guess, with his word, cast him 
into the lake of fire. That's where he's going to end up. Jesus could have done it right then. You know, if you want to think more dramatically, Jesus with his word could have said, flee from me, Satan, and Satan would just, you could just see him blasting back into wherever he goes. No, Jesus could have done lots of things, but we can't do those things. So I think Jesus showed us an example of what, how he defeated Satan is exactly the same way that we can defeat him. And it was very simple. He quoted scripture every single time. And that's all it took. It didn't take the supernatural power of God, the miraculous power of God. It took the word of God and the power that's in it. When Satan tempted Jesus to turn rocks into bread, he quoted the word of God. Man does not live by bread alone. Uh, when Satan tempted him, to bow down to him and that Satan would give him all of the kingdoms of the world. Jesus quoted scripture. Worship the Lord only. But when Satan tempted him to jump off the top of the temple so that the father would show his love for his son and catch him before he fell to his death. Jesus quoted scripture. We shall not tempt the Lord. Then it tells us that Satan left. Do you see how simple, yet how effective? Uh, Do you see again how you can do the exact same thing? This is the only offensive weapon in the armor. Everything else was defensive. The attack is coming. and This armor protects you from it. But if you want to be offensive and take the fight to Satan, just quote the scripture. And he's going to flee. I I find that amazing. Because again, it's so simple. Knowing the truth and even quoting the truth is enough to make this powerful enemy flee. Finally, Paul says to pray. None of this can happen without the prayer. Prayer, of course, is talking to God. When the battle comes, we need our strength and we need our Savior and our Deliverer at our side to help us. When we are tempted, the way out is through prayer to God. So Paul says to pray. I love how he says it. He says pray all the time. He says to pray with all kinds of prayers. So there's no wrong prayer, short ones, long ones, eloquent ones, just thrown out ones, you know, whatever. Talk to God. So all the time, with all kinds of prayers, to pray for all the saints. That's a lot of praying, (laughs) but that shows you the importance of it. All the time, all kinds of prayers for everybody. And then he says, please also pray for me. Let me read those verses to you. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known the boldness, the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. His specific prayer was this. He wanted to be able to boldly and clearly proclaim the gospel. He was under house arrest, and he had already testified several times in court. And he was going to be brought before Caesar and have to give another defense for why he was arrested and what cause he was living for. And he wanted to be able to say it clearly and boldly. He wanted to have the right words to say. And I find this amazing. Again, Paul could have asked, please pray that I get out of this prison. Uh, Please pray for me that, uh, you know, these guards that are always around me would get off my back, you know, or or pray that I, I would feel better, or pray that, you know, he could pray for those things. What did he ask for prayer? For the gospel to be clearly explained and for him to boldly say it. And that's what I love about Paul's prayers in Ephesians as a side note here. 
And notice in the first half of Ephesians, his prayers were for the Ephesians, for them to grow in their knowledge. It was for them to be more mature. It was for them to grow in their faith. His prayers were for them to... They were spiritual prayers. They weren't for their physical healing. It wasn't for their physical protection. It wasn't for these things we so often pray for. And here, he didn't pray for that either, for himself. He prayed for the boldness to proclaim the gospel. I like to think of my prayers to be more biblical, and this helps me. We are commanded to pray for those who are sick. And it's not wrong to pray for what someone may call a selfish thing. God just wants us to talk to him. It doesn't matter what we're praying for. But at the same time, I think we can pray more in line with what God would want us to pray. And and that's praying really in Jesus' name because we're praying for God's will. Now, that's the prayer that's answered 100% of the time. When you pray for the exact same thing God wants for you, he's going to answer it. And so I think that helps us in our prayers. But anyway, I want to read the last verses of Ephesians, so I will have read every verse to you, okay? This is how it ends. It ends this way. Tychius, our dearly loved brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me so that you may be informed. I am sending him to you for this very reason, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus ends the book of Ephesians. It began with grace and peace and it ends with that as well. We've learned a lot over the last several weeks about how great God is and how he's chosen us and he saved us and how he's torn down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile, how he's made one church united and how he has told us to live our lives walking with God and how to stand strong against our enemy. My prayer is simple, that now that we know what we're supposed to do, that we would do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you command us to pray and here we are praying. Father, I pray that you would help us to stand against Satan. And I pray, Lord, that this armor would be effective. And I pray that we would rely on your strength. Lord, I think as the days go by, Satan knows, senses that his time is short. I think his attacks become greater and stronger. But Jesus, I am thankful for your promise that in this world we will have trouble, but we are not to lose heart because you have overcome the world. And also your promise that you are stronger than our enemy. So I pray, Lord, that we would leave here today and live our lives victoriously for you. I pray Jesus in your name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing as we close our service. Again, as I always encourage you, respond to what the Lord has spoken to your heart. And I will be at the back if you want to come. Even during this time of singing, you can come back there. I'll talk with you, pray with you. And after we're done singing, Mary will pray and I'll see you as you come out the door. Let's respond and let's sing.
Yeah. 
somebody testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify song of resurrection hope that fills the weary soul you have made your home inside I'm not alone in the shadow of the valley Word a lamp when I can't see. May I not forget the promise leading me. You're leading me. You light the way. You light the way with a fire by night and a cloud by day. You light the Pilgrims on a journey Hungry for what lies beyond Strangers once now made a family We belong We are tellers of a story of word made flesh and kingdom come Of sinners, saints, and hope of glory Christ alone Oh, Christ alone You light the way You light the way With a fire by night And a cloud by day You light the You're lighting up my faith You're lighting up my wonder With endless grace You're lighting up my failure You're lighting up my fears Everything I've carried Over all these years You light the way You light the way with a fire by night and a cloud by day you light the way you light the way where you go i'll go where you stay i'll stay you light the way you light the way with a fire by night and a cloud by day You light the way You light the way Where you go I 
where you stay, I'll stay. You light the way. You light the way. Gracious to you, the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. as we go. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank for you for your promises. Lord, we thank you for the salvation and the righteousness and the, the, the word and the truth. Lord, we pray that we would use them this week. Lord, we would put them on. Lord, that we would be ready to withstand the fiery darts. Lord, we pray that they would not um, pierce. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you.